Hello everybody, I am Tahir Uluç from Necmeddin Erbakan University Theology Faculty in Konya, Turkey. We are having now an international symposium on religion and civilization in the Middle East. We have three participants who are going to make their presentations on their topics. First, we are going to have Dr. Anthony Edwards from Virginia, from America. He is going to give his lecture, his presentation on entitled Ordinary Orientalism Knowledge and the US-UK Lecture Circuit of Gregory M. Wartebat. And then we are going to have Dr. Yahya Sabahci. The title of his presentation and paper is Comparative Study of Galton Structural Peace and Mullah Sadra's Justice. And finally, we are going to listen to Dr. Javad Dervish Agajani. Both are from Iran, from Sharif University in Tehran, I think. Changing the view of the gen new generation of Muslim youth in the Middle East on religion and explain this change, a special study of contemporary Iran. And our program, because our since our program is being supposed to start at 6.30. I don't want to delay anymore and I would like to give the word, the microphone to Dr. Anthony Adverse to make his presentation. Dr. Welcome. Thank you. And we are glad to have you and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I was unable to upload the slides, but I was able to upload the PDF of the slides to the files option. I don't know, does that work? Abdul Samet, you know, Dr. Anthony, could he, can he upload the paper? Now he's uploading. PDF? Mm -hmm. Is it not possible? Yes, it's loading. Uh -huh. I think uh, we need... Uh, two minutes, then we can share it. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I ended up uploading it through files because the slides menu, the slides option was not working. Can you try to upload it in sites, the slides? Uh, it, it will not. It keeps refusing. Okay. Uh, also, you can uh, send it per email to me. Uh, okay. To it, then I can share it. Okay. Uh, what is your email address? Uh, Abe. A. Or I'm writing in the chat. Wait a minute, please. Oh, okay. Did you see it? I do. Let me copy paste it. Okay, it just sent. So you should receive it momentarily. Success or not? Of the summit? Doctor, our faculty's campus, I think internet connection is quite low today. I don't know what the problem is. I'm now get connected with my cell phone service. All right. Well, I I can just proceed without the pre without the visuals, and we'll go from there. How's that? It's okay for me, doctor. If you are comfortable, yeah, with we'll, that we'll make it. We are, you know, uh, 
we would like to hear you anyway. Yeah. yeah, we will make it work. So thank you very much for having me and I'm excited to share my research. This is actually new research for me. I've been collecting a lot of the data, but I haven't gotten to analyze it yet. So as the title says, Ordinary Orientalism, uh, Knowledge in the US-UK Lecture Circuit of Gregory M. Vortebet. Uh, I decided for the presentation, I'm just gonna focus on the US portion not the UK portion, because I found so many rich sources that I just didn't have time to look at all of it. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a brief biography of Gregory M. Vortebet. Uh, nothing has ever been written about him, minus a 10-page article, which is based off a travelogue of his. So he's kind of silent in the literature on Arab intellectualism in the 19th century. After I give you a brief uh, biography of him, I'm going to present a profile of him as a person, try to tease out some aspects of his identity, his character, and his personality. And then lastly, the bulk of the presentation is going to be on his lecture circuit, uh, specifically on the knowledge and the information about the Middle East that he shared to an uh, excited and anxious American audience in the 19th century, and then also look at the performative values of his uh, presentations and lectures. Uh, this research, I'm framing it within two strands of current scholarship. One trans is the transmission of knowledge, uh, specifically around lecture circuits of the 19th century. There were, we all know about the Lyceum structure in the United States and throughout Europe, and not to mention just the public orations that were happening throughout the Middle East. Uh, secondly, uh, oh, and it popped up, excellent. Let's see, how can I go to the next slide? There we go. All right, there we go. So yeah, so I'm framing it within uh, transmission of knowledge and as you can see some very recent studies on the Lyceum and also lecturing across North America and the Atlantic and the UK. But then also specifically there's work being done on how the United States in the 19th century learned about the Middle East and engaged with it. Because of course there's the Bible and there's texts, but then in the 19th century we have people doing pilgrimages, coming back and telling their experiences there, and then of course writing travelogues. Uh, the current research very much focuses on the textual creation of knowledge about the Middle East and sharing that among the American population. My research kind of looks at how information about the Middle East was shared with 19th century Americans, but orally in a listening format. So let's look at who Gregory M. Vortebet was. And this is a picture of him from his travelogue that he published in 1856. So Gregory Vortebet uh, was born Grigor Vortebet in 1828 in Malta. Uh, his father was an Armenian clergyman and among the first converts to Protestantism. Uh, I, side note, I have no idea what the M stands for. Uh, Gregory M. Vortebet seems to have given himself that middle name, that middle initial. I cannot find out at all what it stands for, and he probably gave it to himself to distinguish himself from his father, whose name was also Grigor of Vortebet. It's the exact same name. Uh, born in 1828, he was educated by the American Protestant missionaries in Beirut from 1835 to 42, uh, and during that time he became a ward of the missionaries because his father passed away. So the missionaries took it upon themselves to educate Gregory along with his two other brothers and his sisters. Uh, around 1846, 1847, and then throughout the 1850s, he became a traveler and a merchant. Uh, he labeled himself that. You find that in ship logs and also in UK census record. Uh, uh, then uh, throughout the 1850s is when he did these lectures. He traveled to the U.S. twice, traveled to the U.K. twice, and returned to Syria for a period of time for, what is that, about four and a half months. Uh, during his second stay in the United States, he received a... Uh, an MD, so he became a doctor of medicine from the University of Pennsylvania, writing a dissertation called Syria, Its Diseases and Drugs. He then returned to the UK, based himself in London for the remainder of his life, but actually worked for the Ottoman Sultan in the Turkish civil service. So he was a physician uh, on the, in Kurdistan and the Turkish, as the sources say, on the Persian-Turkish frontier. And then in the 1980s, he pops up as the chief uh, quarantine physician on behalf of the Ottoman Empire in Jeddah. 
He died in 1893, leaving no heirs, but leaving quite a substantial amount of money. In today's dollars, it's $160,000 worth, which were left in probate. So that's Gregory and Vortebet as a person. Uh, as a profile, we can say he was Protestant. Yes, he saw himself as Protestant. He portrayed himself as Protestant. However, the missionaries were very skeptical of him, where his piety and beliefs lied. Uh, as a child, uh, when he was a child, they wrote that there's a sincere wish that he becomes a disciple of Christ. But then later on, uh, when he was a young man, they said, quote, he is a wandering, wayward youth. Uh, so there were opinions whether he was Protestant or not. He saw himself as Protestant. I found it interesting he was an abolitionist and very much when he was in the UK was engaged in the abolitionist effort, uh, speaking passionately about the needs to end slavery and spoke about the need to financially uh, strangle this institution by way of boycotts on tobacco and cotton products. Uh, by way of his character and personality, he was quite an independent person. He left his family and friends and basically traveled the world on his own. He was also rebellious, though, and quite independent, uh, individualistic and defied expectations. He was Protestant, but he drank alcohol and he smoked tobacco which was certainly to the disapproval of the mis Protestant missionaries. He was an affable, very congenial, charming personality. Throughout his travels, he seems to have cultivated friendships well. Uh, when he was in the United States, for example, he spent a couple of days with the governor of Wisconsin, just, and the governor of Wisconsin showed him around the area. Uh, he was also quite resourceful and quite clever. Uh, he was good at maintaining relationships and also using situations to his advantage. For example, he got in some legal problems when he was in the United Kingdom, uh, being called out by the resident Ottoman director and was called a fraud. And he hightailed himself out of the United K, uh, out of the United Kingdom, and went to the United States, where he started this lecture circuit. So, in the end of the day, he knew how to make things work for himself. So after getting in trouble in the United Kingdom, being called out by the Ottoman minister in residence, we find him in the United States where he arrives in, uh, 18, in uh, late April 1852. And that's where we began his lecture circuit. Uh, he branded himself the Syrian Traveler. So that's a great moniker. Uh, he was, this lecture circuit was from May 1852 to around March, June of 1854. Uh, during this time, he, he gave series of lectures, so a three or four night event. Every night there was a lecture and the cost was 50 cents a piece at that time or free. The location of these lectures were usually Protestant churches, but he also spoke at, you know, like horticultural societies, literary societies, stuff like that. Uh, according to himself, he even spoke before the United States Congress twice. I have not been able to find secondary documentation to substantiate his claim, but if I could, that'd be quite interesting. Uh, he says he spoke at 26 of the United States. So at that time, there were only 31 states in the United States. So he managed to speak at 84% of the country, which is quite impressive. Uh, I've been able to locate that he, that he definitely spoke in at least 13 of those 26, but I'm still doing research, so there's a good chance he did actually speak in all the ones he claims to have spoken. Lastly, his audience... Uh, we don't have any numbers from his U.S. tour, but uh, when he spoke in Halifax up in Nova Scotia, Canada uh, in 1856, uh, the newspaper reports that there were almost 1,600 people in attendance. So we're talking 1,600 people on one night heard him speak. So if we think about, okay, that was one night in Halifax, how did that look in churches and literary and cultural societies across the U.S.? there were a good number of people who came and listened to the Syrian traveler speak. So what exactly did he talk about? Uh, literally 23 days after arriving in the U.S., we find this uh, advertisement in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, which is a newspaper in New York, which tells us he, this, this gentleman is going to speak about Syria and the Holy Land. His lectures are going to have information, and his descriptions and illustrations are going to provide amusement. And it's these two prisms 
uh, through these two prisms that I want to look at what knowledge he conveyed. The information is knowledge about the religions, the cultures, the customs, the languages of the Middle East to an audience that was, let's be honest, the 19th century. There was no Facebook. There was no cable television. There were no cell phones. There was no WhatsApp. Their knowledge of the Middle East were books, travelogues at best, and the Bible. No one even, of course, read the Quran because of stereotypes. So they, he was their first contact with a living, breathing Arab. Secondly, through the lens of descriptions and illustrations, he provides amusement. So here we're going to look at the performative value, the theatrical and the delivery. How did he convey this knowledge? Because remember, if he had 1,600 people in Halifax listening to him, he must have spoke with quite a flair and flamboyance. You do not keep 1,600 people interested in what you're saying unless if you are quite eloquent. Uh, some of the topics that he spoke about. So knowledge, what did he talk about? This is the knowledge of him about the east of the Syria and the Holy Land to the west. He spoke about manners and customs of the Syrians, marriage in the east, progress of civilization, the Holy Land, fulfillment of proph prophecies uh, on Syria, and of course on the present condition and prospects of Syria. With all these topics, of course, you have to keep in mind that Syria here is Ottoman Syria, Bilad Hashem, or, you know, Suri al kibira the entire area. Uh, he, from what I can read, notes in newspapers, and from the text that he had published a good five, ten years after the fact, he presents the region very much to a region that lives up to the American Orientalist fantasies about the Middle East. Quote, he writes, our customs are the same now as they were in the Bible times 3,000 years ago. He, he presents this area as stagnant, but at the same time, it is undergoing change. But the change is not in the entire region. The change is, is specifically only in Beirut and among the Christian populations. So he is feeding this the portrayal or the imagination of the region that the middle, that the American popular community in the 19th century would like to hear, and of which you can even see that to this day in 21st century reporting on the United, on the Middle East through certain media and news channels. Uh, on the religious communities, he seems to abhorred all religious communities except for Protestantism. His, his vengeance and ire, uh, he did not discriminate between Muslims or Christians. On Muslims, he wrote that Islam is, quote, a dead standstill community. Yet on the Maronites, he writes, they are, quote, ashamed to the Christian community, perhaps the most uncharitable and inhospitable race in the world. So he was quite bigoted as an individual. And it's these sort of tropes that he shared with 19th century audiences throughout the United States as he toured the country for over a year and a half. Knowledge, of course, was not uh, unidirectional. He said that he came to the United States, so therefore he came to receive knowledge, to, re to gain some insight about the United States and the West. Of course, all the descriptions the newspapers write about why he's in the region feed very much into an imperialist knowledge framework of him as the backward savage has something to learn from the cultured West. And he played into this uh, framework very well. He always spoke about how he was a pupil of the missionaries and he therefore became enlightened. So the missionaries brought Protestantism, something that was not known in the region until 1821, that brand of Christianity and how he came to become civilized. Uh, one of the most anecdotal evidences of him becoming civilized and his being his critical look at his own culture is he wrote, quote, I do not like this custom of hugging and kissing very much myself. When I returned home after my first visit to America, I was kissed all over my face until my cheeks were really sore, unquote. So this very hospitable, you know, you see your friends for time, you give them a hug, which is common across all cultures. It's not just an Arab thing. It's not just a Middle Eastern thing. But he pre presented this as a sort of backward, uncouth, uncivilized thing that only happens in the Middle East. And therefore, him as an enlightened person, he shuns that. So he tried very hard to demonstrate that he has learned from the West and not just brought knowledge from the East to the West. So this is, this is a, a taste of some of the things he said. But how did he say this? How did he keep audiences enthralled? 
Well, he did it visually. He walked around in full garb. Uh, these are two quotes from newspaper. He was wearing the Oriental costume or apparel in full Syrian costume. Uh, there's a quote in the New York Times one week after he arrived in the United States saying, a stranger on the streets of New York wearing Turkish costume. So it's like he must have had quite the impression to, you know, American viewers who never saw someone from the Middle East before. Uh, side note, he, Gregory Vortovet may have been the first Arab to come to the United States. Current research says it was another gentleman in 1854, but Gregory Vortovet was obviously here in 1852. So that's another line I'm trying to understand. Outside of the visual aspect of him, orally he kept his audience in thrall. I love these two quotes. The first one from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, writes, quote, his style is vehement rather than forceful, and he engages the attention uh, by its novelty. The other one from uh, Missouri writes, quote, he is a fluent English speaker, full of animation and at times eloquent. His gestures, however, were not good, exhibiting too much of a theatrical performer. So he very much used the entire space that he had on the stage or on the pulpit, since he was speaking at churches, to engage his audience and to share with them what the Middle East, the Holy Land, was to him. So basically, this very introductory picture of Gregory Vordebet, Gregory M. Vordebet, and his U.S. lecture circuit from 1852 to 1854 basically presents us with Gregory M. Vortebet, the authority in residence. He was the Arabic speaker in the country. He, his traveling 26 states during that time period, and like he claimed, speaking for Congress twice, he was the quote, live artifact from the Middle East in the United States. As that live, living, breathing artifact, he verified popular American beliefs in the civilizing benefit of Protestantism and also he affirmed stereotypes about the Middle East, unfortunately, culture, religion, etc. Many of the stereotypes which we still see in popular media coverage of the region and the last 20 years, unfortunately, are an example of that. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Doctor, for your presentation. This was a very interesting presentation. I myself spent a couple of time, a couple of months at Harvard Seminary, and read all uh, all what the missionaries wrote about the Middle East in the Muslim World Journal, mm -hmm. one of the I think oldest uh, bases in North America. And actually, I know such uh, missionaries. But uh, Doctor, may I ask just one question? Yes, you know, certainly. Why he? Why did he act like this? Why, you know, he chose to play into uh, the, the hands of... Uh, did he just say what people wanted to hear or <laughs> why was it? Did yeah, you think that why, he... Why, his, why, why, why did he yeah, was, these stereotypes? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, he left no private records. So we have to read what he wrote for the public or what newspapers wrote about him. My suspicion is, and like I said, his personality, he was very resourceful. He was going to do whatever benefited him and to make money and pay for his travels. He realized he needed to engage an audience. So by affirming stereotypes, he drew people in. They gave money to listen to him. Go. So it's kind of like nowadays. Why do people say something that's, uh, what's the word I want? scandalous because it, it it agitates but it also gets you an audience it gets you a soapbox and then people will listen and okay he is a clever person that's clear yeah, and he's very clever. and and his personality is quite different from the other missionaries from north america he is very different exactly you know, which is why the, and which is why the protestant missionaries very much shunned him there are mm -hmm. letters from the missionaries back to their family in the United States who mention, you know, this wandering youth is visiting the United States. Do treat him kindly, but be very wary of him. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah. <laughs> in, in, interesting personality. Doctor, thank you very much for this uh, no, thank insight, you. insightful presentation. And other our other uh, participants, Dr. Yahya Sabahci and Jawad Dervish Agajani. Are you there, doctors? Uh, I'm here. Uh, it was a, an interesting presentation. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the issue of missionaries uh, is a controversial uh, issue, uh, especially oh, yeah. I remember some months ago I uh, had to write a paper uh, for uh, a center in Oxford um, uh, which works on Christian-Muslim relations and uh, we had some different uh, viewpoints about missionaries actually uh, me as a muslim and they uh, who were mostly christians uh, and i think uh, works on missionaries uh, need to be uh, more and more because uh, there are very very uh, different aspects and different persons different personalities uh, in some in uh, missionaries actually however thank you Yes, Dr. Yahya Sabahci is going to present his paper, which is entitled Comparative Study of Galton's Structural Peace and Mullah Sadra's Justice. Yes, Dr. Yahya Sabahci, please go ahead and we look forward to hearing you. Befermayit. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, I, uh, I have done a joint work with my colleague uh, on the topic you mentioned, and um, she will present the paper. I'm of course present here, and we will any we will answer any question after uh, her presentation. So uh, I will ask her to uh, present the paper, and we have of course uh, some uh, slides. Uh, which uh, I will share our screen uh, for you. Thank you. Abdul Samad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can we can see your presentation. Yes, I can see. I think there is another participant who is going to make the presentation. Uh, yes. Okay, just... Yes. We can see no, no. your presentation. Yes. Mrs. Taibe, you can start. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Taibe Mi Muhammad Husseini, and it's my honor to be here. I will present our paper, Comparative Study of Galton's Structural Peace and Mullah Sadra's Justice. We have categorized our paper in four sections. Uh, introduction, framework toward structural peace, and uh, conclusion. Johann uh, Vincent Galton, born in 1930 in Oslo, is a Norwegian sociologist uh, and, uh, and futurist. He is uh, the co-founder of Peace and Conflict Studies, the founder of the Peace Research Institute in Oslo in 1959. And the Journal of Peace Studies in 1964. Galtwing has been advocating for peace and violence for more than 60 years and um, has authored numerous books and articles on the subject. He classifies all forms of violence into three main branches and presents them as a triangle of violence. The vertices of this triangle are direct violence, structural violence, and cultural violence.
Direct violence, uh, violence violates human needs with the intent to uh, persecute. Structural violence refers to, um, to persecute. Structural violence refers to forms of violence that are rooted in certain social structures uh, or institutions. And then structures uh, harm individuals by depriving them of uh, their fund fundamental rights and ultimately culture, cultural violence is symbolic and legitimize, legitimizes the former two categories. In fact, he believes that in order to eradicate violence, it is not enough just to fight violence in its physical form, but also to go deeper and eliminate other forms of violence. Mullah Sadra was the great philosopher, sage, and commentator of the 17th century AD. According to Oliver Lehman, he is arguably the single most important and influential philosopher in the Muslim world in the last 400 years. He is the founder of the philosophical school of transcendent wisdom, one of the most important philosophical schools in the Islamic world. Unlike Galton, who conducts a direct study of violence, Mulla Sadra's views on peace and violence should be extracted from his intellectual system, as violence was not uh, an issue of his time. Several um, principles can be deduced in, in Sadra's intellectual system, uh, which establish uh, peace by reducing structural violence. In traditional uh, applications, Peace was used in contrast to war. But following Galton's work in the field, the meaning of peace also changed. As Galton says, there is uh, the idea of peace as the absence of organized collective violence. In other words, violence between major human groups, which are referred to uh, this type of peace as negative peace. And then there is a new concept of peace, which is a synonym for all good things in the world community, particular, particularly uh, cooperation and integra integration between human groups. With less emphasis on the absence of violence, we shall refer to, the, uh, to it as positive peace. Negative peace only applies to the establish establishment of a ceasefire in a war, while positive peace paves the way for the elimination of the causes of the violence and conflict and the formation of justice and social relations. The comparison provides the point of uh, connection between Mullah Sadra's view, views and Galton's views, looking at peace only in order, uh, in order to end war and violence <clears throat> will not result in uh, almost any relevance issues in Mullah Sadra's work, why remarkable pr principles um, pertaining to positive peace can be found in it. A structural violence is a term first used by Galton. By presenting the triangle of violence, he believes that violence is not limited to physical and direct violence. Rather, any structure in society that hinders the growth of individuals and deprives them of their rights is in fact violence against them. Galton seeks two types of violence, direct and stru structural. Within the fault lines, fault lines in the human construction, gender, generation, race, class, the powerful versus the power, powerless, and the many varieties, political, economic, military, and cultural, nation and country. Structural violence is possible across all six fault lines, Galton says. This social polarization does not necessarily lead to, di to direct violence, but it can also lead to direct violence. If 
those lower down are really hurt or harmed and their basic needs are deeply insulted. Galvin uses the concept of direct violence to define structural violence, saying that there may not be any person who directly harms another person in the structure. The violence is built into the structure and shows up as unequal power and uh, consequently as unequal life chances. In this form of violence, resources are unevenly distributed, as when income distributions are heavily, he are heavily skewed, literacy education unevenly distributed, medical services existent uh, in some districts and for some groups only, and so on. Above all, the power of to decide over the distribution of resources is unevenly distributed, Galton says. Galton believes that because of the di um, different uh, potentials in human beings, justice is, uh, in, human, in human society means the ex existence of a structure in which the ground is prepared for making potentials actual. Anything that increases the distance between the potential and, and the actual, and that which imp imp impedes the decrease of this distance, falls within the scope of a structural violence. That is why structural violence in the present age is also present in issues such as literacy, treatment, and life expectancy. The, um, the uh, absence of such cases, while the ground for um, their reali realization, is prepared in the present age uh, in an example of structural violence. As Galton explains, if a person died from tuber um, collusion, collusions in the 18th century, it would be hard to conceive uh, of this as violence since it might have been quite unavoidable. But if he dies from it today, despite all the medical resources in the world, then violence is present according to our definition. In addition, Galton believes that anything that effectively deprives the man of the ability to understand and recognize his abilities, even if it does not seem to hurt anyone, is a form of a structural violence. Galton also presents a triangle of peace against his triangle of violence, the, the vert vertices of uh, which are direct, uh, are direct structural and um, cultural peace. If a structural peace uh, violence uh, is a system, in which barriers pre prevent human beings from achieving their perfect perfection. Structural peace is uh, the condition in which every human being with all their potentials are capable um, and capabilities can achieve self-fulfillment and actualize their potential abilities. The issue of justice in, in transcendent wisdom is very close to structural peace in a peace triangle, and it seems to pursue exactly the same goal. Mola Sandra has raised the issue of justice from different aspects, including justice as one of the divine attributes that appears in two different areas creation and uh, the, here, the hereafter. From Sandro's point of view, justice is not uh, conventional and uh, worldly, but an objective reality that is widespread and established in all worlds. Exist uh, existential justice means that the creation of the universe is based on justice and every creature has not been deprived of God's grace as much as its existential capability and has received the blessing of existence. 
In Sadra's view, divine providence and justice involves every creature to achieve the happiness it deserves. And it is clear that justice does, does not mean equal, uh, equality, since when capabilities are different, equality means destroying potentials and uh, thus oppression. Considered uh, as one of the fun, uh, foundations of justice in transcendent wisdom, substantial motion takes place in the universe in both creation and legislating. All beings in, in the universe are moving toward their desired perfection. Therefore, it is impossible that the majority of individuals in a kind fail to achieve the goal for which they were created because it involves dominant or permanent uh, or, uh, or permanent compulsion. While the compulsion is neither permanent nor dominant. Thus, the realiz realization of justice and, according to Galton, the real realization of structural peace in the universe may be explained philosophically by the movement of substance in creation. That is, every creature receives, that, uh, receives what it deserves without uh, discrimination and achieves its desired perfection. This movement is more intense in the case of human being due to the existence of free will. Man is the only being who is voluntarily moving toward a higher position. Their, con uh, their continuous movement towards overcoming their shortcomings and accepting difference, uh, different and numerous forms based on their talent and ability plays a decisive role in the realization of justice. Happiness um, belongs to those who have been able to actualize their potential perfections during their lives. Following the religious view, Satra believes that one of the types of justice is to take care of abilities and make them flourish while a clear example of self-operation is forgetting oneself and neglecting, neglecting the original goal of man in the world. Satra's emphasis on the connection between the flourishing of human capabilities and their happiness, that is the happiness of the hereafter and not merely the worldly happiness, can be interpreted in Galton's intellectual framework. He calls for um, encouraging structural peace and, and refraining from structural violence against oneself. According to Galton's theory, if human beings refuse voluntarily, voluntarily to follow the path of um, turning imperfection into perfection, they have applied structural violence to themselves. And legislative justice, which is more relevant to the peace studies, um, encompass encompasses human being with uh, authority and will, and includes both internal and external dominate, uh, dominate, uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, therefore, it can be uh, examined both individually and socially. This aspect of justice can be divided into two forms, exist existential and social. Ola Sadra considers existential justice an important aspect of human perfection, uh, which flourish flourishes human capabilities. In his view, the uh, practical way to achieve uh, existential justice is uh, to acquire good moods uh, which lead to happiness. He sees justice and morality in uh, perfect um, harmony and states that if uh, justice is achieved as the basis of morality in the human soul, excuse me. Excuse me, Dr. Taibet. 
you know your time is quite limited we uh, my colleagues now they are warning me to ask you to keep your presentation a bit shorter thank you i'm sorry yeah, for okay. interrupting you okay 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 uh, okay, I uh, I will say the conclusion and um, will end the present. Thank you. Uh, to conclude, it can be said that what Sadra considers to be the ultimate goal of uh, creation uh, is man's uh, attainment of the position of God's vicegerent and getting close to God's mercy. This ultimate goal requires several in, um, inter intermediate goals without which uh, it is impossible to achieve the ultimate one. All these inter uh, intermediate goals need peace to be reached. And from Sadro's point of view, justice or structural peace is the ground for achieving these goals. Without justice, not only no perfection will be achieved, but also the fall of man into the regression of anger, uh, resentment, and enmity and corruption is inevitable. Thank you for noticing. Dr. Taiba and Dr. Yahya, thank you both of you for this presentation. And in Turkey, I also would like to say that there is a there is an uh, uh, increase in interest in Mullah Sadra's Al Hikma Al Muta'aliya, the transcendent philosophy. Myself also, I have a great interest in his Al Asfar uh, Al Arba'a, which has been also recently translated into Turkish. And nowadays, I am also actually studying Dawud Al Kayseri's Sharh on Ibn Arabi's Fusus Al Hikam with. Uh, uh, Hassan Zada Amuli's edition and Jalaluddin Ashtiyanis. I'm very uh, glad to hear such a presentation and that's very lovely and insightful presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank Professor. You. Uh, I'm uh, real glad to hear that uh, you are familiar completely with uh, these uh, philosophical and mystical works, as you mentioned, Al Asfar, Al Arba, and Fusuz al Hikam, and Hassan Zade Amuli, and Ashtiani. Uh, and my and my uh, book has my book has been translated into Persian, Ayna Harf and Wanur, Dar Maktab Ibn Arabi, by Allah Dawood Wafai. He has translated, and I'm going to inshallah make a presentation two days later, in something like this, an online program. And we would like to have you also physically in Konya to give such, inshallah, presentation. We are happy to hear this. Thank you very much. And we will be happy to uh, be in Turkey and uh, meet you in person, uh, also inshallah. in Tehran, inshallah. Inshallah, I spent I spent some time in Tehran at Imam Sadiq University for a couple of months there, studying Persian and Islamic philosophy, Ishraqi and Mashai. I translated some books into uh, Turkish. You know, Hassan Merishahi's Sharh on Isharat, and then I translated Hikmetul Ishraq, Sharh Hikmetul Ishraq by. Shahrazuri, I am very interested in Iranian contribution to Islamic philosophy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very nice much. Nice to, to meet you, and uh, I'm really glad to become familiar with you. Thank you. You are welcome. Now we are going to have Dr. Javad Darvish Avajani. He is also from Iran, from university, from I think Sharif University in Tehran. I'm not sure if he's present. Did he show up, Abdul Samet? Hello, Abdul Samet. Uh, dear Professor, he's online. I think uh, he will. Uh, doc, doc, doctor, may you turn on your microphone and ca camera? We can't. We cannot hear you nor see you now. You are up. Hi. Hi. Professor. Hi. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Jawad, uh, Dr. Jawad Dervish Agajani is going to make his presentation on changing the view of the new generation of Muslim youth in the Middle East on religion and explain this change, a special study of contemporary Iran. Yes, doctor, you have 15 minutes and we look forward to hearing you. Please go ahead. Microphone is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I try to go to the first slide and uh, begin my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Bismillah uh, rahman rahim Hi, everyone. My name is Jawad Darwish, a postdoctoral researcher at Sharif University. I uh, defended my PhD last year. Uh, from Congratulations. The, thank you very much. Uh, in philosophy of science. I'd like to congratulate the anniversary of uh, the Prophet Muhammad's birthday and Islamic Unity Week. I also uh, like to express my gratitude uh, for the uh, invitation of, uh, and I, uh, my presentation here. Uh, my topic, uh, as you see, is religious, religious promotion in Islamic world with the subtitle of changing the view of the new generation of Muslim youth in the Middle East on religion and explaining the change, uh, a special study of contemporary Iran. Uh, what I do uh, here is uh, first, uh, I try to uh, describe the crisis of religiosity in the Muslims' new generations. And, th uh, and the second uh, step is uh, to uh, explain this phenomena uh, by introducing the intro instrumentalist approach to human being as a false goal in promoting religion. And uh, my uh, uh, third and last step uh, is uh, to introduce an alternative model uh, which I name it uh, an essential approach to human being uh, and promoting Islam. Uh, the impact of the developments of science of the uh, uh, and technology uh, is, uh, I think, uh, two uh, different impacts. I uh, can uh, to mention two different impacts. First of all, uh, is this. Uh, credit religious concept and denies the authority of religions in human life. And the second and different uh, uh, impact of development uh, uh, in science and technology in modern world is a, a crisis of the meaning of life due to the extreme emphasis on the material dimensions in science and technology. Um, these two uh, uh, impact uh, caused uh, that the view uh, on religion is shift from the role based uh, from the content based to the role based. Uh, Today, I think uh, a new generations view on religion as something uh, to fulfill the, the gaps in their life to uh, fill the uh, to bridge the gaps in their life uh, I uh, referred uh, for my claim to the uh, some scholars in Arab and in Islam uh, in Persian uh, societies now uh, first of all Nadal Basum is one of the uh, 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 physicist, physicist uh, in uh, the American University of Abu Dhabi, uh, he uh, said in one of his uh, articles that the protests and revolutions are known in the Islamic world as the Arab, uh, Arab Spring, were often ignited uh, and guided by the youth who educated in the modern education system. Uh, he writes, uh, in the word of other uh, and other scholars, that the uh, preoccupation of this use and uh, the question they asked themselves was, what does it mean? 
uh, to be a Muslim in the modern age. And what does Islam have to say about discoveries of modern cosmology and evolutionary biology? And another uh, evidence is uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, a well-known biologist and one of the main leaders of the scientific uh, atheism in the uh, Western world. Uh, he says, uh, new Arabic translation, uh, I can watch all of this, sorry. A new Arabic translation of the book, The God Delusion, is allowed to be published in Islamic uh, countries. But its illegal PDF file of the Arabic translation is available on the internet. This file, as he claimed, has been downloaded 10 million uh, times. Uh, and I think it's the evidence that uh, the interest of the new uh, views under religion, uh, even atheistic approach. Uh, there are two uh, different uh, uh, research in uh, Iran uh, about the situation of religiosity. Uh, first, uh, Amir Nikbe and Farhad Khosrokhavar, between 2001 and uh, 2003, uh, in some uh, large cities of Iran, conduct the research, and uh, they say among the uh, 17 to 35 year old interviewed, some fast but don't pray, some don't believe in hijab, but they keep their hijab in front of us. Some say we pray according to our own needs and not according to the Sharia. Some say that music has replaced prayer for us. And they summarize and uh, they come to conclusion that the rationality, the type of reasoning and the kind of education of most of the youth uh, we met are new. They are not anti-religious, but they say that the religion does not have the role of the past, but can play a role alongside other social institute, uh, institutions. And the other uh, research uh, said, uh, on, av on average, 92% of response believe in the existence of God and the legitimacy of Islam. It's a very high uh, percentage, I think. But it's uh, interesting that uh, only 65% of them pray and fast, while the percentage of youth who sometimes fast and pray is in, also included in this average. Nearly half of Tehran youth believe that religion is limited to the private sphere and does not deserve to interfere in the public sphere. Uh, I summarize this uh, section uh, in, in this six uh, statement. First, traditional interpretation of religion are losing their authority. Second, uh, paying attention to the uh, function of religion is or in ordinary life is more than the content of religion. Third, the social and formal aspect of religion are much less important than the individual and spiritual aspects. Four, fundamental questions arising from development in science and te technology have uh, diminished the credibility of religion uh, knowledge, religious knowledge in the mind of the youth. Uh, fifth, the emergence of new form of religi religiosity such as secular religiosity, spiritualism, and satanism uh, responds to the need of uh, divinity while avoiding traditional religions. And six, new religions do not follow any specific and universal pattern. Uh, in, uh, in this part, I try to explain this phenomena. 
uh, I think there are two factors uh, should be considered. First, uh, the evolution of the modern world uh, and the uh, contemporary philosophy, philosophy and theology increasingly materialistic and functionalistic. And because of the uh, uh, internet and uh, widespread communication of the Muslim youth, uh, they are aware uh, about uh, the new uh, views in the world, in the Western world, in, in the uh, uh, mainstream philosophy, materialistic philosophy, physicalism, and uh, the new views on religion. And the second factor is how to introduce and promote religion in Islamic uh, countries. Uh, I want to focus on, the, on this uh, uh, factor, the second factor, I mean. Uh, and uh, I uh, distinct between four approach in promoting Islam in Islamic countries. First, I named, uh, I called a uh, jurisprudential approach or fiqh or sharia based approach. Second, theological approach or kalam based approach. Uh, third, ritual approach. And uh, the last one is political approach. Uh, I explained uh, uh, this approach separately in the following. Uh, what is a, a jurisprudential approach? Uh, uh, for example, Professor uh, Said Hossein Nas uh, said that the importance of Sharia in Islam is equal or it's comparable with the importance of theology in Christianity. Uh, we know that the uh, cru crucial role, uh, significant role of the Sharia in Islam but what I mean here is that uh, the approach that uh, reduces the uh, whole, uh, reduces whole of the Islam to this approach uh, is, uh, I, I, I want to mention to this uh, point, uh, this approach feature are, are uh, law oriented, law oriented, obligatory, formal and imitative. And the negative consequences of the dominance of this approach in decisions and in procedures in, uh, in the Islamic societies and the communities uh, are, first of all, neglecting the internal and spiritual aspects of religion. Uh, I mean, when uh, the, uh, this approach is overcome and all of the, the whole of the Islamic uh, teachings are reduced to this approach, uh, the internal and spiritual aspects uh, are neglected. The second was replacing the prescriptive and mandatory aspects uh, in promotion and uh, invitation to religion instead of the persuasive and argumentative aspects as Quran emphasized. And the last one is neglecting the intellectual and epistemological aspects of religion due to the imitative nature of Jerusalem's prudential approach. Uh, the uh, second approach is uh, theological uh, or kalam or systemic theology in the philosophy of religion. Uh, this approach, yeah, as uh, you may uh, know is responsible for dealing with the religious belief or uh, uh, or uh, our um, beliefs or uh, uh, opinions or uh, including uh, these beliefs are the main uh, dimension uh, of these beliefs in Islam are monotheism, resurrection and prophecy prophecy uh, what I mean by the theological approach here is a radical approach to defending the realm of Islam against the theories of the humanities and Western theology. Uh, the negative consequences of the dominance of, of this approach is uh, first lo uh, loss of new interpretation of religion uh, 
uh, that are more relevant uh, to the modern world. And the second one is, uh, it is logical and philosophical approach, lacks emotional and spiritual aspects of religion. And the uh, last one is, it is often used to defend religion, so it is a passive approach. Uh, the third uh, approach is ritual approach. Uh, ritual approach means... Uh, uh, excuse me, Dr. Jawad, excuse yeah. me, you, you know, you, we are expected to end our program at 7.40 and you have only two minutes to end your presentation. Oh. Excuse me for interrupting yeah. you. Okay, okay. Uh, I try to um, summarize. Uh, the third one is ritual approach. Uh, it's about uh, the rituals uh, in the Islam. And the fourth one is political approach. It's about uh, to reduce uh, teachings to those uh, points that are uh, in line with the uh, way or actions of the rulers. Uh, what I uh, offer as an alternative model uh, is a humanistic approach. Uh, it's, uh, it's different with, the, with that four approach that I mentioned. Is, uh, that four approaches are instrumental, has instrumental perspective on human being, but this approach view on human as essential and it's uh, considered the uh, features and char characteristics and needs and capability capacities of human uh, i uh, referring to philosophers like immanuel kant i uh, consider three approaches three dimensions of human being emotional moral uh, and uh, uh, epistemological or, in or intellectual uh, dimension. And I uh, believe that uh, Islam in its origin, uh, original uh, aspects or in, in, in its uh, main content like Quran, uh, focus on all, all of these uh, aspects and emphasize on moral and uh, emotional and in intellectual uh, features of the human. To conclusion, uh, I can say a stati a stati a statistical research shows that religion has not been completely removed from Islamic society, but the model of religiosity has been reduced from an eternal and divine thing to the earthly and functioning thing. Two, there are four false and incomplete promotional approach in the Islamic world through prudential approach, uh, theological approach, ritual approach, and political approach. Despite the differences between these approaches, uh, their shared feature was the instrumentalist beyond human. And the uh, final, the solution is to be moving uh, Sorry, uh, is to be moving uh, toward a humanistic approach in promotion in which man and his material uh, and spiritual needs are regarded original and religion has been revealed basically to meet this. I describe this approach based on three human dimension, namely emotional, intellectual, and moral. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Jawad Darvish, for this insightful presentation. And as a matter of fact, not only Iranian society, the other Muslim societies, as well as other Christian and Jewish, I think, societies, they share the same problem. You know, you uh, said that there is a belief crisis, and this crisis stems from four uh, approaches you know, legal, theological, political, and uh, one more. And if we focus on the, a humanistic religion, which relies on emotions, 
and moral and intellect, you know, our thought, it will be, you know, better. So our, instead of moving away from religion, maybe moving away from the present interpretation of religion or the tradition itself. And we are all, the Muslim world, suffering from the same problem. Dr. Jawad Dervish Agajani, خیلی ممنون شدیم برای این تقدیم و عرض and I thank all of you Dr. Anthony Edwards Yahya Sabbachi and خانم تیبه and Dr. Jawad Darish Agajani and my friend warns me to end the program otherwise I would like to have you know questions from you and continue this uh, program but we need to end. Thank you very much for joining us with your insightful uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Thank You're you welcome. very much. It was a very nice session. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.